Let's discuss moves that make too much sense for the Chicago White Sox to make, but won't because this is the White Sox we're talking about. And let's discuss that with my guest next on Locked on White Sox. You are Locked on White Sox, your daily Chicago White Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, I'm your host, Todd Welter, a lifelong Sox fan and the site expert at SouthsideShowdown.com, part of the fan side of the network. And also I've covered Major League Baseball for outlets such as the Associated Press. And thanks for making Lockdown White Sox your first listen every day, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Make sure to hit the like button on today's episode and subscribe to the YouTube channel at Lockdown White Sox if you've not done so already. And also follow or subscribe to the show at wherever you get your podcasts. And you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet and you'll get started with with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first uh, $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, so losing 121 games and there being some impact free agents to pursue that could help improve the team just makes way too much sense because this is a Chicago White Sox we're talking about. And um, I want to discuss a couple moves that should happen but won't, along with uh, our better days ahead and some 2005 reflection with my guest, former host of this show and current host of the CHGO podcast, Sean Anderson. All right, Sean, let's start with Japanese sensation uh, Roku Sasaki. Even though the Sox have a ton of young pitching, why would it make a ton of sense to add them? And why is the only way the Sox will be involved with them is possibly trading their remaining bonus pool money for a fringe prospect? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really what is going to happen. Uh, I don't suspect the White Sox to be much in on Sasaki and looking at who will be in on Sasaki, there seems to be one clear team and that's the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, right now, the White Sox, I believe, have around 900K uh, in their in international po- uh, bonus pool money. Uh, thanks to James Fox for that number. So it seems likely that if the White Sox are in on a Sasaki deal, it's uh, them helping another team. Uh, I think Although the number won't be high, this will be similar to a Yamamoto 10-30-25 deal. Uh, this is going to be a player that's going to have to sign technically a major league de- or a minor league deal. Uh, will make you know uh, what's it called minimum salary in his first three years as a major leaguer, and then we'll go through arbitration. Uh, it's basically about the signing pool bonus. It doesn't seem like he cares about how much he gets paid, at least in the signing pool bonus. Uh, So if he wants to be a Dodger and really just wants to make this and get this done and over with, he might just uh, sign before December 15th. And if that happens, the White Sox might be involved, uh, giving the Dodgers more international bonus pool money, which means, hey, we might get a random teenager from the Dominican, which we can all get excited about. Well, the only reason why I did bring this up, too, is just because how James Fox of Future Sox brought that up is the Sox international scouting has been so bad. I thought like, well, can't hurt to maybe get involved in that way because they're terrible at getting scratch off prospects in the first place. Are you thinking Sasaki might be a scratch off? No, uh, getting a scratch off from. Uh, oh, like, gotcha. Yeah. I mean, cool money. I'm, you yeah, know, know. Sasaki looks like he's going to be a potential stud, obviously. Absolutely. The more the merrier, at least for the White Sox. Uh, I, I don't know if that is with all of the moves. I don't know the more the merrier on crochet. Uh, I would really want like a really solid, great prospect in return for crochet. But yeah, I mean, whatever guys they can get that won't be playing for them in 2025. Uh, again, the more the merrier, because you just want control uh, for a team that doesn't look to be winning in 2025. All right. So again, the theme of this is the Sox should be making moves that make a ton of sense, but won't. Does Anthony Santander actually makes what sense for the White Sox, given his getting a bit older obviously he's going to be a little bit longer in the tooth as this con- whatever contract he signs proceeds on but they've been trying to replace right field since what Jermaine Dye retired uh yeah I mean un- unless you know a, a couple of those Adam Eaton days too I think uh but he was also bouncing around through center uh yeah I I don't think Santander makes a ton of sense because we saw even when they were in their window even after they won a division title uh, their biggest signing was $75 million to Andrew Benatendi. I, I don't think that they're going to be in Santander's pool. I think that it's going to be over a $75 million contract uh, and Santander likely will just be uh, with a team that's a little bit more serious about winning. I would love Santander, um, but again, this that's the move of a team that expects to compete either in 2025 or 2026, and it doesn't seem like he'll the White Sox will be competing until 2027. So you're going to pretty much waste the first two years of a Santander contract. And with all the talk around, um, you know, Jerry and his lack of spending, it doesn't seem like Santander is in the cards this year. 
Well, and that's the other reason why I wanted to talk to you about this. Bring some different perspective because, you know, I've been thinking, hey, bring Santander in because of how his you need pop. You maybe could be, you know, still productive by the time they're competitive. But it does make sense that if you're not going to be competitive right in the next two years, why spend money? And that's the other reason why I wanted to talk about this is you got these people that, you know, a lot of fans rightfully so are should be upset. But at the same point, if you're not going to be competitive for at least another two seasons, shouldn't you be investing more than in what they're doing right now? And that is improving the front office, maybe improving how you develop your players. It seems like that's what they're doing. Uh, Instead of spending over $100 million on this team, it seems likely that this will be an $85 million budget or below. Um, At least looking at the spreadsheet that I have, I can easily see the team spending less than $70 million. They don't really have anybody that's a high price tag outside of Robert and Benintendi. I could see a ton of just minimum salary players filling up this roster. there is a way that even right now with the players that I have, I think I have about like 20 of the 26 players uh, on that roster. It's about $57.7 million. Um, so you could possibly sign like four players to $7 million a year contracts, or you could go and sign, you know, Santander for one year, 28 million if you really wanted to. Um, but it just doesn't seem like this is the year. It seems like Chris Getz will be taking his time. Although Jerry Reinsdorf did say, you know, Chris Getz can do it the fastest. It seems like Chris Getz's plan was, I'm going to take the long way of doing this the fastest way possible. So uh, I I agree with you. It it would make the most sense if they're looking to win. But Will Venable, I mean, is it even an improvement if they win 20 games more this year than they did last year if they're still 100 lost team. I mean, like there, there's a ton to turn around with this team. And I don't think we're going to see the efforts of Chris Getz fully realized until two to three years now when these players that they're trying to develop uh, get that full time to develop. All right. Let's actually, though, focus in, though, on Willie Adamas for a second, just because I know we just talked about, hey, they're not going to be spending. But the reason why it might make some sense, it would have made sense in you know a different world or a different reality, you know, you know, dimension is the guy is such a great clubhouse leader. And they've been talking about clubhouse, clubhouse culture on that. Um, wouldn't it make sense in maybe let's say they were at least somewhat close to competitive to still dip their toe in the Willie Adamas waters there? Absolutely, especially just because the Tim Anderson experience ended up failing. Uh, you know, we thought Tim was going to be this longtime shortstop for us uh, on the south side, and that really just, you know, obviously didn't pan out. I would be thrilled with Adamas, but, you know, why go and sign Adamas to a ton of money when you have a clubhouse leader and Gavin Sheets at home, Todd? Uh, you know, so it's it's sensical. I think it makes sense because the White Sox have such a gap at the shortstop position, but I mean, they have a gap at first base, they have a gap at third base, they have a gap at catcher, they have a gap in right field. I mean, even if you are relying on Ben Attendee still, uh, you got to hope that he's second half Ben Attendee and not first half Ben Attendee. Uh, there's too many question marks to be giving out $160 plus million plus to Adama. So again, while it would make sense because, hey, you need a shortstop, uh, it just doesn't seem like it's in the cards, which I, I seems incredibly frustrating for White Sox fans. Wait a minute. Uh, I, I thought the White Sox have coverage at catcher. I've been told that we can't go out and acquire a catcher if that's the centerpiece of a potential trade. And also what, where where would you put Colson Montgomery? Oh, I mean, right. If if you signed Adamas, Colson would get the shot at the major league level to play shortstop. And, and, you know, it seemed like he would play third base, which isn't a bad problem. Again, when you have that much talent, guys are going to have to move. Colson wouldn't be able to develop and give you the most uh, value for that player playing shortstop because shortstop's more available, uh, uh, more, uh, what's it called? Uh, valuable in third base but if you're getting two major league players at shortstop and third base that's a long place we haven't been there since 2021 when you had anderson and mancata uh so it's, it's a it's a breath of fresh air for sure if that, that was able to uh pan out but uh, are, are you saying that people are are too clutching of caro here i i think they are and, and i love caro um but i'm actually you know josh nelson he was on the show a couple weeks ago saying that, you know, backup catcher is actually a spot or even starting catcher is a spot that they will use their limited free free agent dollars on. And, you know, some of the people in our comments and even I've seen on Twitter and Sox Twitter world is like, but you got to leave a spot open. And I want to be like, you could develop Carroll like the Braves developed William Contreras, obviously, before they traded him, have him DH and also have him start the season. You know, there's nothing wrong with getting a few more at bats at AAA. Yeah, I think that's just the main thing that's going to happen with Carroll. I mean, only had 26 games at triple a this year and you look at the back injury that he suffered i believe in august it really hampered the end of the year for caro um I, I think josh is right that free agency is going to be a place that they look for a catcher um i've thrown out a reese mcguire reunion because 
it's the favorite word of the White Sox. It's cheap. Um, you know, so I, I could see them bringing in a catcher and going with free agent catcher and Lee to start off the year. Would it surprise me if Carroll has a hot spring that he ends up making the roster? No, um, mainly because we don't see a ton of catchers just logging 150 plus games. Um, and plus with Caro and Lee, you'd be able to get a decent platoon because of Caro switch hitting and then Lee being a righty. So, I mean, there's ways that a Caro Lee uh, backstop or at least tandem would work out. Um, and battery, I guess. I think that's the pitcher and the catcher. Um, yeah. I, how, how that would work out. But I, I don't see them, you know, turning down, let's say, a Samuel Basayo of the Orioles in a crochet trade because he's a catcher. Because if he's a 6'4 beast who can hit, let him play first base and you know and then you have a catcher a first baseman and then you know hopefully a shortstop in montgomery so uh, I, i'm not against adding a catcher it just has to make the right amount of sense right i wouldn't go out and spend money on travis darno two years and 12 million uh, 12 million dollars because that's just you know money you don't need to spend but going out and getting a reese mcguire or a player like that i think it makes sense oh uh, gosh and the name just totally escaped my brain uh the rangers backup catcher would be another guy that i kind of i kind of tied the white Sox to um He's 30. Obviously, just you have the ties to Venable. That would be another one that I'd see. But yeah, re- what? Jonah Heim? Are you thinking of? I believe so. One of them. Okay. Uh, you know, that would be another name that I thought of. But yeah, Reese McGuire, that's another one that makes perfect sense. You just need a guy to, you know, not be Chucky Robinson or, um, you know, what we've uh, experienced, obviously, with Martin Maldonado. Um, one other name though, that I have seen that might make some sense that I could see them actually using some free agent, do- free agent dollars on is, um, Hai Seong Kim. Uh, would you consider if they just signed him, even, even if he's for a four year deal, because Colson Montgomery might just be a better third baseman potentially, would you consider that a successful off season? If they signed Kim? Yes. I think, I think it'd be an interesting move. Um, I, I don't know if it's again, going to be in there range and i do wonder how much kim is peaked uh kim i know has had what about two seasons of plus five or nearly five war um and then you see the dip in in 2024 i wonder if a player of that size just being five nine if he's going to be limited um growing especially being 30 years old like how is this player going to age gracefully um i i, I don't know I, th- I think it's not gonna be a successful off season no matter which way you put it Chris Getz can go and get out, uh, you know, all of his number one targets, but I, I just don't think his number one targets are any of these guys that are in the top 25 of free agents. Like they're going to go bargain bin shopping and you better like, uh, what's that Ray Romano movie uh, with uh, it's like, it's like welcome to Elmwood or something. Yeah. Like you're, you're getting, you're getting that movie. You're not getting shark tail, you know, you're, you're getting a, a budget buy. So while Kim would be interesting, I, I just don't see it playing out. I think a team that has, playoff aspirations would be more active and more willing to give him just a, an increase in budget rather than the White Sox. The White Sox are going to have a very strict budget that they're going to have to deal with and be very, you know, within that budget range to operate. Um, it, it doesn't seem like they're going to be able to go out and spend that type of money on Kim. Maybe they do. And I'd be excited. Um, but again, it, it does seem like even though it's like a three year, 30 million or three year, $40 million deal. Um, it does seem like it's still high in the sky. Let's get into if there are better days ahead with Will Venable as the new manager and the front office shakeups next on Lockdown White Sox. The World Series, Super Bowl, the Olympics, the world's top athletes get to play in these top level sporting events thanks to one thing, teamwork. And teamwork can also protect your financial legacy and your family's future. Select clothes, licensed insurance agents are the perfect teammates when shopping for customized affordable life insurance. They can find you the right policy to keep your financial legacy safely in your family's end zone. Select Quote is one of America's leading insurance brokers with nearly 40 years of experience, helping over 2 million customers find over 7 hundred billion dollars in coverage since 1985 other life insurance brokers offer impersonal one size fits all policies that may cost you more and cover you less while select quotes licensed insurance agents work for you to tailor a life insurance policy for your individual needs in as little as 15 minutes you invest so much time to take care of yourself and to be the healthiest best version of you select quotes exclusive policies can reward that effort and if you're in good health they work with carriers that get you the same day coverage for up to five million dollars no medical exam required and these policies are more affordable than you think you could get coverage for up to one million dollars is as little for as little as twenty dollars per month head to selectquote.com and a licensed insurance agent will call you right away 
and with the right policy for your life and your budget. Select quote. They shop, you save. Get the right life insurance for you for less at selectquote.com slash locked on. Again, go to selectquote.com slash locked on today to get started. That's selectquote.com slash locked on. Welcome back to Lockdown White Sox. I'm your host, Todd Welter. Again, make sure to hit the like button on today's episode and subscribe to the YouTube channel at Lockdown White Sox if you've not done so already. And if you can't get the show on YouTube, Lockdown White Sox is available on all major podcast platforms. So make sure to follow or subscribe on places such as Apple or Spotify. Either way, get your 30-minute fix of Chicago White Sox baseball venting with me. Uh, joining me on the show is former Lockdown White Sox host and current host of the CHGO White Sox podcast, Sean Anderson. And Sean, uh, what are all the all CHGO diehard deals going on right now? And where can we also get all your great content that you do with uh, Herb Lawrence and Vinny Duber? Absolutely. Uh, you can always just check us out at the CHGO Sports YouTube channel. We air uh, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. And if you do want to chat, we have a Discord. Uh, so you can go join it, allchgo.com slash diehard. Uh, if you do sign up to be a diehard, you get a free shirt. You get access to all of our written content at allchgo.com. You get access to that Discord channel. And we have some uh, discounts for people, whether it be events or merch. So thanks for the plug. I, I, when anybody gives me their time of day, I want to make sure you get your plug uh, back so on that. So Will Venable is the new manager. Great resume, obviously. Uh, you know, everybody's heard me talk about him, and I had White Sox Dave on last week. Now I want to get your take on that. How big of a hiring was this for the White Sox to make? I think it's exciting. Again, when we talk about Chris Getz getting his number one uh, you, you know, uh, number one on his want list, at least when it comes to free agents, it seems like it's pie in the sky, but it seems like he got his number one guy for the managerial position in Will Venable. So I think it's an exciting hire. I think Will Venable, while he might not be a finished product, is somebody that's going to grow into this managerial position. It seems like a person that needed a little bit of time growing under Bruce Bochy, and he seems confident that now he's able to take on this challenge. I don't know if it's going to be smooth sailing for the first year, but as we've said, it's a pretty bleak output or outlook for the White Sox in 2025 and 2026. So Venable can have his struggles and ups and downs. I wonder really what Venable will be come year three as a manager, how he grows and how he develops, and who are we looking at in 2027 when it comes to this managerial position. I'm excited for him, but I'm also not putting any pressure on him, and that's probably why he accepted this job. There's no expectations, Todd. I mean, again, they can go 61 and 101, and we might throw them a parade because they won 20 more games than last year. Right. We're not we're not a basement dweller. We're just a bad team. Yeah. I, I had somebody email me asking me and I did a show about it was somebody asking me, like, if he got, you know, say the 61 wins again, should he get manager of the year votes? And I was like, <laughs> well, well, let's pump the brakes there on that one. Like that would be considered a success. Like if he got them to 70 wins, yes, I think he should get some consideration. But 61, you know, uh, that that's just meeting the. uh but that's actually meeting expectations. What type of standards you should are get you getting? like medal of freedom or, or something if, he, if he's getting 61 wins with the 2025 socks? Yeah. I mean, what, what standards then are you going to hold them to? Um, because obviously wins and losses aren't going to matter at least for the first two years. So I mean, what are big, you kind of looking for? Yeah. The biggest thing is what every white Sox fan wants. I want to see less ground balls. I want to see balls in the air, which is going to be a little bit on Ryan Fuller, the new director of hitting, but I also want to stop seeing plays where we saw, you know, three of them in one game in Baltimore where Miguel Vargas can't call off Andrew Benatendi and Andrew Benatendi cannot call off, uh, you know, uh, whoever's playing shorts, Jacob Amaya. And then Amaya can't call off Deloach after Benatendi's taken out of the game because someone ran into him. Like, I just want to see clean baseball. Um, it's understanding or it's understandable when young players make mistakes, but when it's Robert and Ben Attendee converging on a ball in left center field and they're unable to talk it out, it's like you both are making over $15 million. Like, let's figure that out. I just need to see some competent baseball. And that's why they lost 121 games because they couldn't be competent on a night in night out basis. Every single night we knew the White Sox were playing. We knew that it was, you know, 75% chance they were going to lose that game. I just would like a fighting chance for my baseball team in 2025 and cleaning up the garbage is part of that. You know, let's be aggressive on the base path, but also let's not get ourselves out on the base paths. Um, it's just about playing smart baseball. And if the White Sox had a hint of that in 2025, I'd be thrilled with Will Venable because this team's been so stupid. Yeah. I mean, I, I just want to see them lose. If like what I'll be judging them on is, did you lose? Cause you were just overmatched. And if you, right. made, if you made some mistakes, do they at least counter out like, if you pushed one button and it was neutral, fine. I don't want him pushing all the wrong buttons like Pedro. I mean, everything that Pedro pu pushed was like, what the heck? I mean, it always resulted into a net neutral. And that brings me to, is he going to even matter 
Because do baseballs ma- do managers even matter anymore in baseball? No, not really. I mean, I've I've said this about Will Venable. I don't think the expectations are on him. It's on Chris Getz and it's on Jerry Reinsdorf. Jerry Reinsdorf said, Chris Getz is my guy. Chris Getz said, I can fix this. Chris Getz said, give me all the money that we would have spent on free agents and let's put it into the underside and underworkings of this organization. If he's unable to get this underbelly working, then where are the White Sox? They're exactly where they are in 2024 or 2023 when Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams were fired and Chris Getz took over. It is on if Chris Getz can get Will Venable an operating major league baseball team. The White Sox have not operated like a major league baseball team probably since like 2020 or 2012. Um, I mean, even though they had success in 2021, it's kind of by the skin of their teeth and spending $185 million. Like if you spend $185 million, you're probably going to have a decent amount of luck to make the postseason. They did. And they got smoked by a real baseball team in the Astros. Um, I, I think that it's, it's just about, looking decent and, and and hopefully they're able to 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 get that but it's not really unventable i mean i mean like again how many guys are, are is that he that he's managing now we're going to be on the team in 2026 um it's it's about keeping a good clubhouse vibe but also chris Getz has to help out his manager um and give him the appropriate talent to you know be on a major league baseball team we have not seen the white Sox consistently produce products from their minor league system to their major league system. Can Chris Getz finally turn that around? That's the biggest thing about this entire next three years. And it's not even, it's really nothing to do with Will Venable. Well, and also I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Cause I would also argue then Brian Bannister and, and Fuller are probably the two mm-hmm. more important people, because again, they're going to be in charge of the pitching and the hitting. And I actually like that. I, I like that they're forward thinking now to say, we should be playing baseball from the big leagues to the complex leagues, the very same way. And yes, you do need to tailor certain like for a swing or maybe a a delivery, but otherwise we should be playing baseball the same way. Is all these front office changes a sign of better things to come? You'd hope so. I mean, uh, we are being told that things are changing and that's the, the only thing that we can just rely on or or at least take with us. Um, There's not much to look forward to until they start, showing it on the field and you have to give them time. And plus with this, I mean, since 2013, the Dodgers have made the playoffs every single year and they've won two world series. Like that's 11 years there where they've won the, the, it all, uh, you know, twice. If we have a organization like the Dodgers, that's consistently winning 90 team, 90 games. Like that's the biggest success. Like it's, it's not even judging on if you can win world series. It's how competitive can you be on a year in year out basis? Um, so I, 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 I think it's really on Bannister and, and Fuller, like you said. Um, I mean, Will Venable is just going to have to be able to put the right guys in the right situations in a lineup on a day-to-day basis. But if those guys have no talent, then you know what are the expectations? Yeah, and even Mike Shirley would be probably the uh, uh, even more important because he's got to go get the talent because it sounds like, again, they want to be a draft and develop team. Uh, at least that's where you got to start on a rebuild, obviously. Um, but should we just always still be scared because there's this boogeyman named Jerry Reinsdorf? Yes. You expect him to sabotage this at some point. Uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. I did, it's... And not, not by him passing away, forcing a sale, because that would actually be possibly a good thing. Even though that's sad that we have to wait for yes. him to die. It's it's such a weird position that Sox fans are in with that with that clarification. And, and I, I totally hear you on that. Uh, I, I don't know what else Jerry can do. I. I I, the only thing that I think that he can do is just, again, withhold money from Chris Getz. And if he doesn't do that, they should be fine. But if it gets to 2027, Jerry Reinsdorf is still the owner of this team. He didn't get his stadium at the 78. Is he going to be willing to spend on this team at all when they are finally able to turn that page? Hey, we have you know six of the nine positions filled out by guys from a minor league. Let's go spend on three you know decently price-tagged free agents and fill this team out like, Will Jerry allow Chris Getz to do that? And it's just the waiting game, which everyone loves to see. What a 80-something-year-old, probably 90-something-year-old Jerry Reinsdorf will do then. So I don't think there's much that he can do to like negate Chris Getz's work right now, but it's Jerry Reinsdorf. I'm not going to put it out of the, the possibilities. Although, should we be confident? I mean, because I keep hearing 2027, but should we be confident that this team could be competitive by 2027? I mean, you got a few good hitting prospects obviously on on the way but you still got a dearth to the point where you got to trade Garrett Crochet 
but obviously the young pitching is great, but could that get injured? I mean, I, I just don't know if we can be so confident about 2027. Um, am I, or can we? I don't know. I'm just honestly throwing out 2027 because it seems far enough, right? Like it just seems like I, I have ADHD and I'm always just putting things off. So, I mean, 2027 just sounds right. Todd, you could be correct that they won't be competitive until 2030, but that just sounds too depressing. So it's possible. I mean, 2027 yeah. could be too optimistic, but that also is, is a fairly depressing thought. So uh, I, I think 2027 should be enough to give you two draft cycles. Hagen Smith should be up by then. Noah Schultz should be up by then. You should know what Colson's giving you. You should have clarity on Brian Ramos and Edgar Caro. Like there should be some clarity on if you can have a future with the current crop of prospects, not even including the guys that you're going to get in a crochet deal. So I think 2027 is at least the next like true check-in because they're, I could just right now for sure, right off the 2025 and 2026 White Sox. If they're like 81 and 81 in 2027, it wouldn't be the most shocking thing. Yeah, actually, you know what? Now that I go through it, because I got to know sometimes like this is why I bring people on because to get perspective, I think about it, you know, you really need just three or four guys, like three or four really good bats in your lineup that stay healthy, unlike what happened with Robert Moncana and Eloy. So, yeah, if Montgomery, um, Ramos and Carroll are those guys and they've got the profile. Yeah. And then you've got the rotation. So I think that's well, a good I, I think that's a good target. Look at the Tigers, too. I mean, the Tigers really didn't have any bats. They really relied on all of their pitching in the second half and were able to turn around and make it to the playoffs. I, I think if you have a good enough or a good enough amount of arms, you can you can go fairly far uh, and make it to the postseason. And I think the White Sox, again, the only positive side of this organization is what Brian Bannister has been able to do. So I think the pitching is there, and I think that's going to be the thing that gives them the most hope. As long as they have those arms, it's just can – three guys have like an above average year and you, you should get enough hitting to, you know, at least be 500 ish, a little bit below 500. Like the next time this team wins 75 games, I'm probably popping a bottle of champagne. I mean, I, I'll be so excited. Dude, I'll come down to Chicago with the Andre champagne. Let's and, go. You know, because that's what they use. I, I love how people are always like, well, what team was it where everybody was complaining that they used the cheap champagne? I'm like, yeah, that's what they use. That you, you buy in bulk, you're going to get either Andre champagne and that's what you're going to be sprayed with. Um, you're so, not spraying Vuv. Yeah, you, you're not, you're not, you know, busting out the Dom for even a World <laughs> Series. You, you, you're just not, not, you know, th that stuff is meant to be drank. Andre is meant to be celebrate like again, like you won the World Series there. It's Wednesday. I love to do retro segments with Way Back Wednesday. Sean and I are going to go over the glorious 2005 season next on Locked On White Sox. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel America's number one sports book because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. And I always maintain FanDuel spreads, over-unders, and money lines are fun to play. But if you want to win big or at least double your money, FanDuel's parlays, props, and futures is the way to go. And we may not like ties in America, but if the first half of the Chicago and Green Bay game ends in a tie, and that's the first half, it's at plus 850 the last I checked, and say you put 10 bucks on it, you just won $85. Uh, Bears somehow go into the locker room up. That's at plus 210 at the last I checked. So at least a chance to double your money if that somehow happens. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL.
here with former host of this very show and now current host of the CHGO White Sox podcast, Sean Anderson. So, Sean, the first time you and I talked, which, again, I'm grateful for you uh, talking back with me in July, you suggested next time, let's talk about the 2005 White Sox. So let's talk about it. So actually, I'm going to do dealer's choice to you. Do we want to talk about certain instances or do you just want to start throwing out names of players? Because I know that's what you wanted to talk about. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, who, who doesn't want to talk about the 2005 White Sox? It's the only thing that brings us hope, uh, and we are coming up on the 20th anniversary along with the return of Sox Fest, where we get to see uh, all of the, uh, the the players from the 2005 team uh, come back. I guess I'm going to start on Frank Thomas, uh, just because it's so weird, like, looking back as a, like, because what, I was seven when the White Sox won the World Series in 2005, eight, whatever. Um, you always heard of Frank Thomas, but I never really understood Frank Thomas, the player when I was growing up. And now looking back, it is absurd that the White Sox in 2005 were able to win a World Series without Frank Thomas, him only playing 12 games and then him being casted off to Oakland after that. I didn't even know the drama around Frank Thomas. There's a great video uh, from Jolly Olive uh, talking about Frank Thomas's redemption with the A's in 2006, where he nearly won another MVP. Um, and there's a quote from Paul Canerco after Frank Thomas missed, I think, three straight games and then was an hour and a half late to pregame stretches and then wasn't included in the lineup. And this was, I think, in 2002. And he said, if a guy's unhappy here, get him out of here. And I never thought there was that type of contention between Paul Canerco and Frank Thomas. And it's pretty absurd that, or it's absurd to me to think, like, what would this team look like in 2005 if they had Frank Thomas? And would it be a positive thing? Because it seemed like Frank, at least in the later half of his career, was kind of a sour note. In the White Sox clubhouse, obviously, there's the line from Kenny Williams saying, stay out of White Sox business to Frank after he leaves and goes to Oakland. I, I wonder what if Frank Thomas is healthy. Does that give them a better chance to win because it's Frank Thomas? Or does that hurt him because, you know, he has an ego and he's, you know, an aging, injured Frank Thomas? Oh, Sean, let me tell you about the days of growing up with Frank Thomas. Man, you just made me feel so old. That's why I had to go with my old man voice there. Like, it goes well with the green. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the, the, I grew, I mean, that, that was my guy growing up. So obviously like, you know, that, um, the one thing about Frank Thomas though, during that brief stretch, it was actually needed. Like they were, that was when they were starting to cool off. So him going on that stretch did actually help them keep the momentum going. So that was a big thing. Would they have continued to hum along with him? I mean, again, if I remember 2005 correctly, he was just kind of, starting to become a face in the crowd. I mean, it was his final year of the contract. Uh, yeah, all that drama was there. I mean, and everybody was just getting so tired of the injuries. I remember that. I mean, it was, you know, the big skirt, as everybody was calling him. And Ozzie Guillen, that, that was the biggest thing to me is Ozzie actually managed Frank. And one of his biggest antagonists in the clubhouse in the 90s that was well reported was always Ozzie. Ozzie would literally take box score, you know, the lineup scores, because Frank would be looking at his numbers and say, stop looking at your numbers. We lost. <laughs> you know, and all that. So they would have these contentious, you know, issues. And also Frank did let a lot of his business, you know, failures. I mean, he was a terrible investor. Obviously now he must be doing something well because he's endorsing products left and right. You know, somebody probably got in his ear and said, Frank, just do endorsements. Stop investing in like, you know, he invested in a studio like that. That's a terrible way to try to make money unless you're Suge Knight. <laughs> you know, he did that. The divorce definitely railed on him. And I remember too, like he was on, I want to say it was 97 when he only hit like 17 home runs. I remember him being on where he's hit like 260 or something. And I'm talking about, well, my numbers will get back. It was always him talking about his numbers. And don't get me wrong. I love Frank Thomas. That was my, like one of my biggest heroes. He was my guy in the nineties, like on that. But yeah, I, I think that I, I, I think he would have been more of a face in the crowd, but he did have this ability to let his ego kind of get in the way. But then again, 1993, that man hit in the ALCS. I mean, mm -hmm. he hit big time. Oh, absolutely. And in that postseason run with Oakland, uh, they win their first series because Frank, I think, had three homers in that series. I mean, he was still able to produce then. And I was wrong. It wasn't 12 games, 34 games for Frank in 2005. They're 24 and 10 with him. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it seems like, you know, Frank Thomas is probably a better player than Carl Everett at DH. I'm not even probably. So I think it might have been a boost, but that's interesting. Just I, I do wonder, you know, what what Frank's like legacy in Chicago is because it seems like a lot of people are like fond of Frank, obviously. Um, and you want a ton of MVPs as they should be. Uh, but it is weird because it does seem like 
it was it wasn't the best marriage between the Sox and uh and Frank Thomas and I think he only had three playoff appearances only two with the White Sox like that probably bugged him too and it's probably why he's looking at his only stats because the only thing that's making him happy is hey I hit 35 home runs because I'm on a team that's you know below 500. Yeah and in 2000 like that was the total letdown because again they they crush the baseball during the entire season and then they get to the playoffs, play the Mariners and they can barely score a run. And that was because yeah, Frank and Mags didn't have the best um, playoffs. So yeah, I agree with that. And I do think though, time heals all wounds. When I remember 2005 was, I, I think that did kind of solidify Frank's legacy as he comes back, plays those great 32 games, crushes the ball. And then he comes out, throws out, you know, I think he threw out the first pitch. I forget which game he did and everybody's like, I loving it. But then, yeah, when he got, then the sour grapes did kind of set in when he got so mad that how dare the White Sox replace him with Jim Tomei. And I was like, Jim Tomei plays. He's there every day. And Frank was constantly getting hurt after two, after 2001. So, yeah, I mean, obviously time heals all wounds. And, and it helps when you're part of now a great postgame show that slams the team every day. So, <laughs> right. It's, it's um, nice to see him back. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I, that, that's the thing, too. I mean, I like looking back on that uh, Tomei acquisition for 06 to 08, uh, there was some talk with uh, a coworker here that they should have kept Aaron Rowan and then they should have just re-signed Frank. Tommy was the right choice there. I mean, that, that like moving on from Rowan and, and not re-signing Frank, I think absolutely that was 100% the right choice. So it's just, it, it's weird to see that, you know, 2005, it was the best time in the franchise's history and the best player ever, even though he was on the team, might have been like a thorn in their side yeah. if, if, they, if, if, he, if he was uh, healthy enough. All right, I'm seeing this going around on Twitter on who would win in a series, the 2005 White Sox or the 2016 Chicago Cubs. So who are you taking? Um, I mean, I think it would go seven. I think it'd be fairly competitive. I'll obviously take the White Sox because I'm, I'm on a White Sox podcast. I haven't <laughs> given it too much thought, but I I think there's one website that is like can do the simulations between those teams. And I think the White Sox win like 55% of the time uh, compared to the Cubs 45%. I think the pitching just gets it done. And I know Cubs fans are be like, oh, it's Kyle Hendricks and John Lester and et cetera. But there was just really something special about that 2005 run. Uh, so I'll just, I'll, I'll go with our four best pitchers and, uh, you know, Burley, Garland, uh, Contreras, and then uh, Freddie. So yeah. uh, I, I think, I think I'll take the Sox. And I'd have to see the simulations. Like, what are the contexts are you putting in? Because again, like one of the reasons why the White Sox won that 05 World Series was those four were just dialed in. Like they were hitting their spots. They were getting everything. Like you weren't really going to be able to do much. And now that all the luck, all the luck went their way. The AJ mm -hmm. no okay, all that stuff went their way where the Cubs, yeah, they some luck went their way, like a well-timed rain delay, but not a whole lot. You know, they kind of had to, grind their way to that world series win. So, you know, I, I think what, what type of context are you putting into place? That's why I can't really tell, but I would still go with the white Sox. I'm going with those four pitchers. So, yeah. I, I mean, again, it's, it'd be weird for us both wearing socks hats to say the Cubs would win. Yeah. It'd be very weird. You know, even though again, my grandpa was a diehard Cubs fan and went to the ground, never seeing the Cubs. Although again, he started out as a white Sox fan. So at least he got to see the white Sox win a world series. Let's go. All right. Well, Sean, I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Todd. Well, that wraps up this edition of Locked On White Sox. Thank you for making Locked On White Sox your first listen today. For your second listen, find Locked On MLB. Baseball guru Sully brings you a daily blend of humor and baseball, keeping you updated on every rumor and story throughout the offseason. Find Locked On MLB on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. And I'll be back tomorrow to power rank the rumored teams that are interested in trading for Garrett Crochet. Feel free to leave comments about today's discussion with Sean Anderson. You can leave them at the episode page on YouTube, X, formerly Twitter, at Todd J. Dubber, at Locked On Sox, or email me at LockedOnWhiteSox at gmail.com. Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.